Should we get started? I'm Dan Cable, and I'm going to be talking with you about some research um, that I've been working on for about four years now. I tried to pool a couple of different projects together. So uh, in terms of the big picture, um, we're going to talk about this notion of a best self, which is maybe a concept you haven't thought about a lot. It's this idea that we all have this self-concept, and it's this idea that we think we know who we are and what differentiates from other people. And I'm not really a brain neurology kind of guy, but I do some reading in that area. And apparently, these are actual synapses that are connected to nodes in our brain. And there's a node called a self-brain. And then we attach different content to that. It might be musical. It might be wise. It might be interesting. Whatever little tidbits that you would attach to that. And one of the things that I'm working on is this idea that we might be able to activate people's best selves, the concept of who you think you are when life is most real for you or when you're getting the most out of life or when you're making your biggest impact on others. And so that was just some thinking that I was doing. And now I've gathered a bunch of data about that. And mostly this is to share some of that early uh, data with you. None of this has been published yet, so it's all kind of not even to the presses yet. Um, so I hope you'll find that a little bit interesting, but it certainly is uh, cutting edge for me. This is a question that kind of inspired some of this work originally. The Gallup Institute goes out and they ask a lot of questions to a lot of people. And one of the questions that they ask looks like this one. They said, at work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day? And how many people? Well, they went to 1.7 million humans, 101 different companies, 63 different countries. And I'm asking you, what percentage do you think answered yes? Do I? Three, we're a little lower. <laughs> You're really critical as an audience, I can tell. Fine. Um, the answer was actually 20. 20 people. Um, out of 100, say that each day at work doesn't mean all day long, perhaps. It just means that at some point during the day, they feel that they can be their best. And that was a little bit depressing for me. You know, this idea that for most people, uh, you know, work is something you do when you're not at your best. You know, the, you can't be your best. I, I found that to be a little depressing. And so I started doing a bit of thinking and research on, on that topic. And, um, you know, it turns out these people are not evil. They just really like Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> they like a Friday so much that Thursday is nice. 20%. So uh, let me kind of show you. Oh, wait, we're going to go back one step. Um, and then we're going to turn up the volume on this. I wanted to share with you something to mostly amuse you, like a little amuse of sorts, um, but it will be relevant. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, the relevant part of this is there's all this really cool evidence that when people say yes, some stuff happens. So like when you feel that you can be at your best, one thing that happens is you like your work better and you stick around longer. So there's a couple of studies showing they're less likely to quit. Not so surprising. A little more surprising is they're showing that when employees say yes at the business unit level, the greater percentage that says yes, the business unit does better. And then the third thing, and the one that I think connects the most with this little video, is it turns out that when employees say yes to this question, customers somehow know that and like it. So I just wanted to share this with you. Um, and I'm just going to click on this, and maybe it'll make sound. Let's just try that. Good evening, folks. Welcome aboard Southwest Go, Airlines good. Flight 372, service to Oklahoma City. Those of you that have flown us before know that we do things a little bit differently here on Southwest. Some of us tell jokes, some of us sing, some of us just stand there and look beautiful. I, unfortunately, can do none of those. So here's the one thing that I do know how to do. We're going to shake things up a little bit. I need a little audience participation. Otherwise, this is not going to go over well at all. So, here's what I need, especially you guys in the front, because you know what's coming. All right, I need a beat, all right? 
All I need you to do is stomp and clap, and I'm going to do the rest because I just, I've had five flights today, and I just cannot do the regular boring announcement again. Otherwise, I'm going to put myself to sleep. So, you guys with me? Yeah. All right. So, give me a stomp, clap, stomp, clap. Come on, stomp, clap, stomp, clap. Stay on beat there. There you go. Keep that going. This is flight 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle, David in the back. My name is David and I'm here to tell you that. Shortly after takeoff, first things first, there's soft drinks and coffee to quench your thirst. But if you want another kind of drink, then just holler. Alcoholic beverages will be four dollars. If a monster energy drink is your plan, that'll be three dollars and you get the whole can. We won't take your cash, you gotta pay with plastic. If you have a coupon, then that's fantastic. We know you're ready to get to new places. Open up the vents, put away your suitcases. Carry on items, go under the seat. In front of you, so none of you have things by your feet. If you have a seat on a roll with the exit, we're gonna talk to you, so you might as well expect it. You gotta help evacuate in case we need you. If you don't want to, then we're gonna reseat you. Before we leave, our advice is put away your electronic devices. Fasten your seatbelt, then put your trays up. Press the button to make the seat back raise up. Sit back, relax, have a good time. It's almost time to go, so I'm done with the rhyme. Thank you for the fact that I wasn't ignored. This is Southwest Airlines. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you very much for my beat. I appreciate that. You will not get that on United Airlines, I guarantee. <laughs> so, it's interesting to think, who taught that man that rap? You know, where'd that come from? Do you, do you think that they had an off-site? <laughs> <laughs> do you think they sort of got everybody in a big room and said, we have looked into the future and we see there's a consumer group that prefers rap music? <laughs> You know, this is just a guy that thought, I can do this. And he's in an organization that apparently encourages people to do that. But what's interesting is, in my experiences, most CEOs would see this man as a liability. <laughs> I mean, what if he insulted someone? You know, so for real, I do think that there's some interesting tensions between allowing or encouraging people to play to their best, to play to their strengths, and control and trust. And there's some interesting issues there that we won't really get into today, but that I think create some boundary conditions around which most of the research that I'm going to tell you about can work or not work. Okay? So now let's talk a little bit about this concept of potential. You know, I think a bit about human potential. <laughs> um, it just seems really interesting to me that compared to lots of the other animals, we seem to have a lot of potential to change the world. You know, we're not really supposed to fly, for example. I don't know if that's something that you ever think about. You know, other animals that don't have wings, they just walk around. <laughs> or if you think about health care. <laughs> My dad was real worried about polio growing up. But now, most of us aren't very worried about polio because a bunch of scientists got together and says it doesn't have to be that way. I think it's kind of interesting to think about what humans are capable of when they're able to push on some boundaries and just see what's possible. And so that's kind of like the high end of some of what I'm interested in thinking about. There's this guy named William James that in 1905 said, compared to, uh, uh, compared to what we ought to be, we're only half awake. Our fires are damped. Our drafts are checked. We're making use of only a small part of our possible mental resources. And this is another one of these things that kind of inspired me a while back, just to, to think about how in life it's kind of easy to kind of go on to autopilot and to not really worry so much about what you're capable of or what your potential is, but instead just to kind of get through it, to not make people not like you, you know, to kind of keep the keel even, if you will. So that's something that I was thinking a bit about. And, and then there's this, um, this article that I read, and this is only going back six or seven years now, by some researchers at Michigan. And they started talking about this narrative that we all carry around in our brain. And this is that concept, I was saying, of yourself. And they're supposing, they're hypothesizing that we've got a best self, which is kind of your 
own representation of the behaviors and the qualities and the characteristics of who you are when you're at your best. And that clicked for me because at the time I was learning about a different concept, which is almost kind of like um, a statistical concept, which is called positive deviance. And it's kind of a fun concept. Um, a way that I can make it really clear to you is if you work with McDonald's a little bit, like right now I'm doing a little bit of work with McDonald's, <laughs> They have 5,000 restaurants in the UK alone. When you have a sample size of 5,000, it means that most key performance indices, most metrics that they care about, there's an average. Most stores, 70% roughly, have an average. And that could be customer satisfaction, or that could be uh, basket diversity of the order, or that could be profitability of the store. But one of the interesting things you can do is you can say, well, who is three standard deviations out? Because it turns out there's 20, 25 restaurants that are making three standard deviations greater than average. And the cool thing is you can go and visit those stores. <laughs> it turns out that it's not just a magical strategic figment that maybe someday, if we all pull together, we might possibly get to. It's saying that today, for real, there is a store that we can go visit where they're making three standard deviations more money than average or making customers three standard devi deviations happier. So you can go there, and it turns out they're putting cocaine in the burgers. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's what it is, that case. <laughs> so thank you for that. That's heartwarming. <laughs> to slice right to the core of this issue, my own hypothesis was, what if I could help us with our own positive deviance? And again, this is a little weird, but the idea would be we all go through life with our average. And it's fine. We don't kill people. We go to work. You know, it's all right. But then sometimes we feel more alive. Sometimes we feel like we're having a greater impact on the people around us. Sometimes things are so alive for us that time goes away and hours turn into minutes and the subjective consciousness of life feels like you're thriving or flourishing. It may not happen so often, but what if we could identify those moments and then go visit them? What if we could dig in a little bit and see, like, who is that person? <laughs> How do we do that more often? So that's sort of the cause, if you will. That's the mission. I just wanted to lay that out before you because I've started messing with this now. <laughs> and it's pretty weird. I don't really see a lot of other people doing this sort of thing. So what I'd like to do is kind of... Um, tell you a little bit about how it might feel to be in one of my little experiments. Um, imagine that you're new on the job. Say it's your first day. And say it's the case that things seem a little alien. When you join a new company, things often seem a little difficult to predict. And maybe you're not very sure of yourself at that moment because you don't know how you're going to fit in. You don't know how to add value. And picture they hand you this report. And this report is about 15 or 20 pages long. And it turns out that it's full of these little stories. And they're little stories that people have written about you when they've seen you at your best. And the first one might be a friend of yours from college. And you haven't really thought about this story, maybe for 20 or 25 years. And then maybe one is from a sister. You've known all your life, and seven years ago, you helped her with some thing that she needed help with, and she writes about that. And then you have an old work colleague from the last place that you worked that writes up something about a time we were there all night in the office, and we couldn't break through, and blah, blah, blah. Picture just getting about 20 or 30 of these in a row. It's a pretty odd thing. It's probably not something you've got before, but what is it doing? It's starting to highlight this person that you sometimes are and these impacts that you've had on humans. And maybe, because there's 30 of these stories, you can start to put together trends and say seven different people across work, family, friends, and career have sort of said the same thing about me when I'm at my best. And that report is what I'm going to tell you some research about. I, what I'm fascinated by 
and I'm going to start sharing this, is what does this type of a report do to the physiology of a human? What happens with the heart? What happens with the stress responses in your sweat? And then we move to emotionally what's happening. How do you feel? And then you might move to how does your mind start working? Cognitively, can you solve puzzles better? Can you be more creative? And socially, when we form teams around our best self, do the teams do better? Is the team functioning better? Do they share more with each other? Do they care more for each other? These are the sorts of things that I'm going to share some research because I've got a bunch of studies now, and it looks like the answer is kind of yes. <laughs> it's starting to seem really clear that while none of us do this in society, there might be some, some hidden benefits to this hidden potential. And if we bring this potential forward and make it salient in our brains, it might be a way to get more out of ourselves. For now, we're waiting until we die. We call those eulogies. <laughs> Maybe we don't have to wait that long. You know? <laughs> what if? <laughs> All right, let's try this thing. So one of these studies was done in, uh, in India. This company is called Wipro. And they were really, really frustrated because they hire a lot of people. They're about a 200,000-person organization. And, you know, they hire 50, 60, 70,000 people a year. A lot of them quit within about six months of being hired. Not because it's not a great firm, just because there's a lot of options for people that have these sorts of skills. And well, they called us in because they run this call center where they try to help people whose printers break. Say you bought a Hewlett Packard printer, it doesn't work, you cool up Hewlett Packard, you're actually calling Delhi, they've got a team of people dedicated to that printer solving your problem, right? So those people were often quitting six to eight weeks after being hired. That's a big problem. Customer satisfaction wasn't that good. Just as they were getting good, they would quit. So they called up me, they called up this woman at Harvard, called up a guy at UNC, and they said, can you do one of your funny little science experiments on us? <laughs> make our people stick around a little bit more. And I, I want to describe that experiment to you. I think I've told you most of this stuff. The only thing that I didn't tell you about here, am I supposed to be on this stage? Yeah. <laughs> you like that a little bit better? But then it's not so, yeah, okay, I'll be up here for a little bit. Um, the job's stressful because nobody calls and says, thanks, it's working. That's what I kind of want to say. Generally speaking, they're angry. <laughs> they're angry because this stuff doesn't work, and you fix it for me. And people don't call up and say, hey, I you know, just want to let you know it's good. It's all good. <laughs> so what do we do? We got 1,000 people and that they just hired, and we just put them randomly into one of three conditions. And we did this by the level of what they affectionately call batches. Um, 15 to 20 people get hired, and then they kind of do everything together. Uh, we would almost call this like a pledge class. They, they show up together the first day, they get trained together, and then they, they work together on all the shifts together. They take lunch breaks together and coffee breaks together, and they go home together. So they form some pretty tight social uh, group there. Well, what we did is we assigned them the one of three conditions, and this is where I'll spend a little bit of time just kind of telling you about it. One of them, we didn't do anything. We just said, do what you usually do. You're a pretty good company, and we'll call that a control. In another one, we said, give us an hour. Before you put them there, give us an hour. And here's what happened. In this one, which we're calling the identity condition, we had the general manager come up. So this would be a skip level, not the shift manager, but the general manager. He came in and he said, listen, before we teach all this stuff about the job, we want to start with telling you about the values of Wipro. I want to tell you why I'm proud to work here. So he told some stories. He told three stories about Wipro's three core values and what it means to him. He finishes, 15 minutes. Then he says, now, I'm going to put you into your groups. What I want you to talk about is what I just said that you might be proud of. Is there anything that I said that you might be proud to tell your family about? That's the specific way he said that. So he puts them in their groups. They meet each other. Off they go to the control condition. So it's one hour extra. And then there's a third group. And in this third group, we get the same general manager. He comes out and he says, before we tell you all about the job, we kind of want to know more about you. We want to know who you are when you're at your best. 
So I'm going to give you 15 minutes right now. What I'd like you to do is write down three stories of when you felt like you were at your very best. When have you felt most alive? So he, he says it doesn't have to be at work, but he, they wrote those down. 15 minutes. Then he says, now you've never met each other before, but I want you to introduce yourselves as your best selves. I'm going to put you in a room, and I want you to maybe read one of those little stories you just wrote. Talk about what they can expect from you when you're at your best. What kind of person are you when you're at your best? So they do that. It takes an hour. The whole thing's an hour. And then they go into the traditional approach. And so what we have is a pretty beautiful research design because everybody got the basics. But then these two different groups got these other things. And so I'm just going to share that with you. What did we want in terms of the outcome? Well, what they wanted was less people quitting and customers being happy. So we tracked them for six months. And in terms of the customers being happy, we actually got their key performance metrics. We, every single call that's made gets taped, and then it gets graded. And then we got that data. So what do you reckon? Like in this one, this, this was actually published. Um, this one was published in Administrative Science Quarterly. And um, what we looked at first is, six months later, how likely is it that they would have quit? And so, say the control was at 50%. They all, half the people were gone in six months. What do you reckon with the organizational identity intervention? Well, it was pretty good. They were pretty happy to know that it was 16% less, and it was statistically significant. So that was kind of cheers all around. But when the general manager asked these best self questions, it was 57% less, which is somewhat shocking. It was only an hour. And it was free. <laughs> so they're scratching their heads. And they're saying, that's really odd. Um, let's look at the, the customer data. So 61% was the average for the control. Not very good. Their goal is to be an 80% company. <laughs> Organizational identity, it did get a little better. It went up to 66%. So that wasn't bad. We did no harm. But it was not statistically significant. In the personal identity one, where we asked about the best self, it goes up to 72%, and it was statistically significant, which is, again, somewhat shocking to them because it was about an hour the first day. And that means they got six months of statistically significant better customer service without paying more. Or did they? Maybe they did pay more, but in a different way. Maybe they paid for some emotional connection by allowing people to come to work and hang out with people who know something about who they are when they're at their best. Now, we don't really know that, but this study was the first empirical study that intrigued me. It confounded me. It disturbed me a little bit. I had kind of wished and hoped at the time, that the organizational one was going to work. And that's what's so awesome about doing research. It's like Christmas time a little bit. You don't really know what's under the tree. <laughs> and sometimes you actually learn things. <laughs> this man says, but enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? I make this because I do think what we're doing here is weird, and I want to draw our attention back to that again and again. I don't have this all solved. I literally started working on this three years ago. Most of society doesn't do this, what I'm going to describe to you next. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be. We used to think the world was really flat. <laughs> you know, things can change. But for now... Um, part of what we're getting close to, I think, uh, are assumptions around, is this right to create these reports and give them to people about who they are when they're at their best? I mean, what if it makes them complacent? What if it makes them arrogant? Is it really appropriate to go out to people's old bosses and family and friends and say, tell us about when this person is most alive? When have they made their biggest impact? Is, is that even appropriate? Got to think about that a little bit. But here's some data. First one that I'm going to tell you about is at Harvard University. And this is the one that I wanted to see, we wanted to see, what's happening physiologically 
what's happening cognitively, what's happening emotionally when we give people these reports. So in this one, we kind of dialed it a little up from the one at Wipro. In this one, what we did is we went out, we had them give us names and email addresses of four people. And we went out to those four people and we had them write these three different stories. Who are these people when they're at their best? And then half of them, we gave it to them. But we didn't give it to them before we got them all hooked up. We measured their sweat, we measured their vagal tone, which is how uh, healthy the heart's working. We had them spit in a cup to get like their stress responses. You can get these crazy uh, responses out of this. So we take all these sort of measurements and then we put them through some, some, <coughs> some work. Like we put them in a pretty tense problem solving task. I'm gonna share with you and we said, you have one minute, you're at Harvard, can you do this? That's one thing. Another thing is we ostracized them a little bit socially in a legal way and we didn't. <laughs> hurt them for real, but I'll tell you a little bit about that. And we just checked to see, like, how do these people deal with this if they have been given this little report versus haven't been given this little report? How do they solve problems differently? How's their body responding? What's happening there? Okay, so let's just take a look at this. Now, let's start with the stuff that's not very surprising. Positive emotions were statistically, significantly, and substantially better when you give them this little report. That's not that surprising. And when we told you you're great, and you say, ah, that does feel nice. Now, some of those positive emotions are ones like awe and gratitude, which are kind of interesting ones, but there they are. Now, this second one is much more surprising. There's something called vagal tone, and it's how healthily your heart works. And it's a really good predictor of, for instance, things like having heart attacks and things like that later. And we found that compared to an, an average, we just kind of looked at the d-scores on these things, when you're in the control, you're statistically significantly worse in vagal tone. Maybe just because you showed up at Harvard University. Maybe it's kind of like also going into um, a hospital. There's evidence on this sort of thing. It just kind of like stresses you out a little bit. In the treatment condition, when we just gave them this little report, they dealt with that differently. The heart worked better. Kind of interesting, statistically significant. Nice big samples. Then we give them this candle creativity test where we said, you have one minute to solve this problem. What you have is a box of matches, a box of thumbtacks, and a candle. How are you going to fix that candle to the wall? How are you going to do that, by the way? You, ma'am, how would you do that? Yes? Uh -huh. She's a genius. This is correct. This is called nonlinear thinking. And what happens is only about 20% of the people can get that in a minute because it's fixedness as a box of tax. And a lot of times people can't get out of that and think of it, yeah, but it's also a candle holder if we dump the tax out. So what we did is we looked to see how many people could get to that solution, could they articulate that solution. And what we found is that 21% got that right in one minute. And we found that in the treatment condition, when we gave them this one self-report, 51% of the people got that right. Hugely statistically significant. So it appears that having your heart working a little bit better maybe is tied to the way that your brain can work creatively and solve new sorts of problems. Then we looked to see what happened with this sweat. What did it tell us about your stress re reactions and whether or not you were resilient? And what we found here in the cognitive stress one, which is that candle test, it shot up a little bit for the people in the control who didn't get this little report. But when we gave them this little report, it was statistically, significantly, and substantially reduced, which means that somehow the body went into a more resilient mode of sort of dealing with the stress, but pushing through it and coming up with a solution. In terms of the social stress, this is a little naughty, but what we did is we put them in front of a laptop. We had them play this game, and it's called Cyberball. Has anybody ever played Cyberball? It's just a ball-passing game, where literally there's your little Adavar, Adavan, Adavar, Atav, Avatar, Avatar. Sometimes I take Adavan. <laughs> no, stop. So they come up with this little person online, and they're playing this little ball game. And you have to actually catch it and then throw it. It takes some concentration. People find it fun. We know they find it fun because you film them in the little webcam that's on your laptop. And they seem to be enjoying it because they're sort of going like. <laughs> Thank you. 
So what's happening with this thing is that um, <laughs> we just had the other two stop passing it to them. And their faces fell, and they got really upset. But they got a lot more upset when they didn't get this little report back. And so, again, in terms of this social stress, they were able to sort of statistically, significantly, substantially cope with that social stress. And I think I have one last thing here. By spitting in this thing, we're able to get something called SIGA, which is your immunity to disease. It's one of the best predictors of getting a cold within a week. And we learned that it was statistically, significantly, and substantially higher when you got this report versus when you didn't. So this is pretty strange. For me, it's surprisingly powerful what these four people can do for you and do to you, in a sense. And so this guy says, somebody in the office is spreading rumors that I'm not a good boss. Find them and kill them. I did start thinking then about how most organizations do feedback and do 360s and performance and stuff. And I started thinking like, boy, this is really different. It seems to me like most companies that I work with want more creativity. And they want people to be happier at work. And they want to connect with customers better. But we kind of don't use this approach at all, ever. <laughs> we use this other one that often highlights some negativity and makes people feel that they have limitations. Which, of course, we all do. Which ones do you want to focus on? Fixing limitations or playing to strengths? Very, very interesting work. So the last little study I'm going to tell you about, I think in two minutes or less, which is absolutely fine, is just to say that a bunch of people come to Harvard University four times a year, groups of 60. And what happens is they come there to the School of Government, which is called the Kennedy School. And we put them into these teams that are together for all four weeks and have to solve this major pandemic flu exercise, which is really threatening. And they're drip-fed a little bit of data, and they're tweeted data, and they have to kind of go on the Facebook and get data about this, ep this epidemic, basically. It's like Ebola, basically, in Boston. And it's all fake, but it seems really real. And they have to together find the right response. How would we respond to this as a state government? And then they present the last day to the state government, as well as Harvard professors of government. And then they get evaluated for how well they did. And we just did something kind of tricky and funny. For half those teams, we randomly assigned them that on the first day, we gave them a report. But now we turned up the volume a little more, and we got 10 people to write about them. And then the other ones, we did that for them, but we didn't give it to them the last day until after they gave the report. The judges were blind to what condition they were in. So we just took a look at this. And what I'll tell you about this is we measured a bunch of things about how they felt in their team. So if I was in this team and I worked for four weeks, I could rate people in terms of how safe did I feel speaking my mind? Do I like these people? Would I want to work with these people again? How well did we do? How much did I learn? They actually evaluated that, and on every single one of those indices, it was statistically significantly higher when we gave them this little report. But the real kicker, and the one that's going to help it get published in a journal that nobody will read, <laughs> is that the panel who was blind to condition also saw that. Meaning that by giving them this little report, they actually did better work and created a better response to this faux Ebola virus. So I think that we're, do I have um, two minutes left, or what do I have left? Excellent. Let me just tell you a little bit more um, by way of pulling this together. It's kind of my calling now, I think. Um, I'm going to keep doing this for a while. It seems to help people. It doesn't seem to make them complacent. It doesn't seem to make them arrogant. It seems to make them say, wow, I can be more. It seems to make their bodies work better. It seems to make them perform better at work. <laughs> it seems to make them happier at work. There's just a lot of um, humanistic outcomes. And that humanistic outcome is kind of where I'd like to leave you in some ways. I I'm real frustrated by something, and I hope you are too. It bothers me a lot that most humans on the planet at this point spend most of their waking hours 
doing something that they don't really feel they're doing their best. We're only on the planet a little while, and most of that time is either sleeping or at work. And that's just a truth. You can kind of do the facts on that thing. So what happens is the sleeping, I mean, it's pretty good, but it's not always feeling like me. I can't get rid of it. I tried, so we got to get that. But then what happens is what you've got left, it feels like that's not real life for most people. Work feels like a thing you do when you're not living. And then it's like, let's race to the weekend so that I can start the living bit. I got these IOUs called money. That bothers me a lot, and it just seems to me that maybe we could create organizations that were able to make work feel more like real life by encouraging people to recognize who they are when they're at their best, and then play to those strengths so that work feels like an opportunity for the self-expression of who I really am. So I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you.